So if you're wondering whether or not you can get 3D pop on an APS-C sensor camera, answer is a definitive yes. Look at this, this is awesome. <laughs> Welcome to the channel folks, my name's Shane. If you know the channel, you know I'm a huge fan of Panasonic cameras. I shoot micro four thirds and full frame. But if you didn't already know, I also own two Sony cameras, two Sony full frame cameras, the Sony a7S 3 and the Sony FX3. And now this little guy over here, the Sony FX30. This is essentially the same camera externally. It shares a lot of the same features and actually has a few more features than the FX3, except it's half the price and it comes with a sensor that's also 50% smaller. Here's my Sony FX3. I've used this on my tech channel now for quite some time as my primary camera. I got this long before the Panasonic S5 Mark II came out, the GH6 came out, and a bunch of other cameras that are now on the market. So we're kind of spoiled for choice, but I really feel like the Sony FX30 might be the way to go instead of buying this. And I'll talk more about that throughout this video. This Sony FX30 is my first APS-C sensor camera, and there's two main reasons why I went for it. One being that I own the FX3, I can reach behind them in a multi-camera environment and know exactly where all of the buttons and dials are. There's nothing worse than having four different types of cameras in a four camera setup. So I'll be pairing these two up alongside my Panasonic S5 Mark IIs, which I now have two of those as well. So that's my multi-camera setup for my tech studio. And secondly, the lens support is fantastic. Not only can I use all of my full frame lenses from Filtrox and Sony, but I can also get dedicated APS-C lenses for the Sony E-mount, which allows me to get much smaller lenses and they're also less expensive than the full frame counterparts. Well, on the most part anyway. Let me cover some of the quick details that you need to know about the Sony FX30 if you haven't already watched 50 other videos. The Sony FX30 is now Sony's entry point into the cinema line. So if you're thinking about doing documentary filmmaking or if you want something a little bit more video centric than your typical hybrid camera, that's where this camera shines. Being that the FX30 is the baby brother to the FX3, you can get this at half the price of the Sony FX3, making it a great entry point if you're thinking about doing any type of serious filmmaking. I love the fact that we get tally lamps on the front and a big red record ring on the screen, letting you know that you're actually recording, especially if you're doing a piece to camera like this. I can see the red light on the front of the camera. It's an awesome design. While the FX30 will make a great B camera to the Sony FX3, if you don't have an FX3, it can be your primary A camera. Without question, I tested both of these in my studio and they looked indistinguishable distinguishable from each other. We get a brand new 26 megapixel APS-C sensor that gives us 14 plus stops of dynamic range. It also gives us far less rolling shutter than prior APS-C cameras from Sony. So if you're gonna be doing handheld work, this would be a no brainer. This new sensor has 759 phase detection points and it's super sticky whether you're tracking humans, animals, eyes, or tap to focus, whatever the case may be, it just works. So if you're looking for a camera that has great autofocus, this would be the way to go. One of the reasons why we get such premium 4K image quality, whether we're shooting in 25 or 50, 30 or 60 frames per second, is the fact we get a 6K image downsampled into 4K. This will look slightly sharper to the eye than that of the FX3. The FX30 has the same IBIS or in-body image stabilization system as the FX3. So if you're gonna be doing any handheld work, you don't have to rely just on a digital crop like you'd find in some other Sony cameras like the ZV-E10, which is a great entry level camera. But if you plan on doing any type of handheld work, and you want those 10-bit codecs, this is the way to go. Another thing I love about the FX3 alongside the FX30 is the active cooling fan. This doesn't compromise the dust or weather sealing, but it allows the camera to stay cool under any shooting conditions. You can dive into the menu and adjust the fan speed and intensity and a few other parameters, but just as it is, I can shoot outside on a stinking hot day like today and not have to worry about the camera overheating. Let's talk about the recording quality at 24, 25, 30, 50, and 60 frames per second. I think the image quality out of this camera looks spectacular. I'll talk more about low light later, but just as a straight up video camera, the FX30 is able to give you excellent results. The great news is this camera is fully capable of shooting up to 120 frames per second in 4K with quite a heavy crop. It's 1.6 times or something like that. So if you already have a Sony FX30 and you're a bit unhappy with the slow motion results, make sure you have adequate lighting. Today, outside shooting any slow motion out here, it's going to look beautiful. Anytime I'm in the studio, I usually double the intensity of my LED lights, which gives me a great way to compensate for the increased shutter speed. Anytime you're shooting at 4K at 120 frames per second, for example, your shutter speed's going to be cranking, which means you're gonna get a dark image. You need to compensate with better lighting and then the results will look beautiful. But overall, on a bright sunny day, you won't have any problems with this. If you plan on shooting low light slow motion, get the FX3 or A7S3. 
The FX30 is basically a mirror of the FX3. We can shoot in either 8-bit or 10-bit 422, all the way up to 4K at 120 frames per second. We can also shoot in the all intra codex, which makes your editing experience a whole lot easier at the expense of larger file sizes. We can also shoot in the heavily compressed H.265, and this is a really great codec if your computer can handle the editing. The biggest difference with H.265 is we get a much more compressed file, so the computer has to unpack that on the fly in editing, and not all computers can do that smoothly. So for my money though, if you just want a quick turnaround project, use 8-bit. If you want to do more color grading, you can shoot in the 10-bit 422. And if you want the easiest editing experience at the expense of larger files, you can shoot in all intra. I'm back in the studio, we're gonna do a quick comparison between the Sony FX3, which I'm shooting with right now, and the Sony FX30 while I talk about this monstrosity over here, the optional XLR handle. The great news is with the FX30 being that it's the entry-level cinema camera, you're not forced to buy the audio adapter. I would seriously consider buying something smaller than this, unless, of course, you got your heart set on using this as some sort of handle for low to the ground shooting. I just find this very impractical. It doesn't fit into any camera bag that I own properly. It's just an odd shape. And it, even does, it just has so many flaws, right? So the first thing, it doesn't have a cold shoe mount anywhere on it. I had to buy a small rig adapter to get that to work. Look at Panasonic's DMW XLR adapter here. Cold shoe mount on the top. So much more practical than this. So if you're buying this for a handle, I would say maybe just buy a small rig accessory and cage for your camera. It's gonna save you far more money but the audio quality is great on this. I can't fault it in that regard. Another thing I don't love about this is this little bracket for the shotgun microphones. It's made specifically for Sony microphones. Now, if you have a Sony shotgun microphone, you're in business, but all of my Rode microphones don't fit in here. It's just way too loose. So I need to tape around my microphones or buy a rubber insert. Again, it's another thing to buy, but the audio quality of this is fantastic and it connects thanks to the little terminal on the bottom here directly into the hot shoe mount on the camera. If you're dying for XLR audio and you don't think you'll ever need an actual top handle, I would say buy one of Sony's other options over this. This is great if you need something with a top handle. If you don't, get something much smaller as it will fit better in your camera bag. And now I'm over to the Sony FX30 using that G Master F1.4 at 1.4. I was previously shooting with the 35 millimeter F1.8 on the Sony FX3. Let's now do a side-by-side -side comparison between both cameras so you can get a good sense of how they compare. And after doing this in my own time before shooting this review video, there's next to no difference in the overall image quality. So if you're thinking about starting a YouTube channel and you want premium image quality and you're in a studio situation like this, the FX30 is an absolute no-brainer. The truth is though, you can get away with almost any camera in this scenario. Everybody harps on about low light performance when it comes to smaller sensitive cameras. But if you're in a situation with studio lighting, it absolutely doesn't matter. So don't get sucked into all of the marketing hype. If I was to do this all over again, without question, I would just buy two of the Sony FX30 cameras as opposed to getting this FX3 for my needs, where I'm not always pushing the low light performance to the maximum, the FX30 will do the job. And you're looking at it now. So let us know what you think of the image quality and whether or not you can see a huge difference between both of these cameras. Let's check out how both cameras compare in low light. So the FX30 is on the left and the FX3 is on the right. I'm holding a handheld RGB LED light and it's on 1% brightness. Zooming in to just under 200%, you can see just how much cleaner the FX3 is already. Over to ISO 3200 where the FX3 again looks beautifully clean. You can see the grain kick in on the Superman suit on the left. While the FX30 does have more grain than the FX3, this is still completely usable. Again, we're zoomed in at 180%. And now with both cameras set to ISO 5000, the light is still at 1% brightness and I've taken some steps back. I think it's pretty clear already if you're looking for a great low light camera, the FX3 or the A7S 3 is definitely the way to go. I've actually taken a few steps back and the light is still on 1%. And as you can see at ISO 8000, it's more of the same, although there is some more noise starting to creep into the FX3, whereas the FX30 has far more grain, especially on that backdrop. I've taken another step back, the lamp's at 1%, I'm waving it over my head, just bouncing the light off the walls, and at 12,800, the FX3 almost looks overexposed, and it's handling the noise a whole lot better. Don't let this test put you off the FX30. In regular lighting conditions or any other situation, it's going to perform brilliantly.
I mentioned at the start that the FX30 has a few new tricks up its sleeve over the FX3, the first of which is the new focus mapping option. The way this works is pretty simple. Anything in true color or real life color is in focus and everything else is out of focus, either behind or in front of the focus plane. Where I can see this being really handy is if you're doing anything via an external monitor, much like this. This allows me to see the focus map as opposed to not being able to see standard focus peaking on an external display. If you find this a little bit jarring to look at, don't worry, you're not alone. I feel exactly the same way. The next of these new features is called Focus Breathing Compensation. This will help you get rid of some of the focus breathing, which is the zoom in and out effect that you'll find going from minimum focus to infinity. Notice as I bring this lens cap both in and out of frame, the edges of frame or the corners aren't zooming in and out whatsoever. This is a really handy feature and being that we get an oversampled 6K image, we're not actually losing resolution when recording internally within the camera. Just note though that the crop will be different for different lenses and not all Sony lenses are supported with this feature. With focus breathing off, we get a wider field of view, but we get way more zooming in and out on the corners. You can see how much of the desk I lose now as I bring the lens cap up into frame. And back with the focus breathing compensation enabled as a point of comparison. Let's talk color science. Now the FX30 has the same great color science of the FX3. So if you just like hitting record and getting great out of camera results, then the FX30 will definitely deliver. Now I'm using currently the movie picture profile, which is one that I've slightly customized from stock. This is how it looks straight out of camera. And I've been using this picture profile the entire time. Let's take a look at another one. This is the no picture profile, another one of my favorites. I've used this more than any of the other picture profiles on the original Sony FX3. And on this camera, it looks every bit just as good, except it has a bit more of a green tint to the skin tones, which is why I use the movie picture profile and kind of shift it a little bit more towards red. This next one's the S Cinetone Profile, which is another great one. I actually shot a short film using this on my original FX3. So this color profile gives you great sort of cinematic, flatter colors straight out of camera that you can easily grade just by adding an extra bit of contrast or adjusting the levels. It's a really great picture profile and I can highly recommend it. And now you're looking at S-Log3, which is the log shooting profile that captures the most amount of dynamic range, which means you'll see more in the shadows and more in the highlights behind me. It should retain all of the information in the sky and those trees and bushes back there. This is the profile I probably should have used for some of the video while I was outside in maximum sunlight earlier. So it would have retained more of my skin highlights and so forth. But overall, if you wanna grade the footage, this is the way to do it. You can also add a LUT inside of the camera and then record in real time with the LUT of your choice. That's a whole other process. I'm not gonna go into that in this video, but you can get great results shooting with S-Log3 and capture the most amount of dynamic range. Shooting with a camera with this design took me a little while to get used to because the joystick is on the top. The muscle memory would always go to the back. I think like 99% of cameras on the market have joysticks on the back. So you've gotta get used to having your thumb in this position, but ergonomically it was fine and I have no complaints. As you can see from the body design, we get quarter 20 screw points all over it. This makes it easy to attach a cage, or of course, accessories directly into those screw points. If you plan on using the audio adapter, just know it takes up two of those three on the top. Being that this is part of a cinema line of cameras, there's still a few things missing I would love to see added in future firmware upgrades. But as we know, Sony and firmware upgrades don't go hand in hand, but there's no shutter angle on a cinema line camera. So we're still using shutter speed. This could be added in a firmware upgrade. I really wish Sony would push this through at some point. Secondly, there's no DCI 4K or 17 by 9 aspect ratios. I'm sure they could make this happen. It would be a welcomed addition to the Cine line. Thirdly, if you're used to working with waveform and vector scopes, you're going to be disappointed that the FX30 doesn't have either of those. Now, if you're doing any type of serious filmmaking, of course, you may already have an external screen that has all of those tools built in. But if you don't, you don't get them on the built-in LCD screen. So just keep that in mind. Each camera has their own set of trade-offs. I just want to mention some of the negatives in this review because I know a lot of the Sony fanboys will only talk about the positives. I'm not a Sony fanboy, but I do enjoy using this camera and I'm working within its limitations and strengths. Each camera system has its pros and cons. I think the pros far outweigh the cons and if you're just getting started this makes for an awesome camera that you can use long term. This could be my A camera on all of my YouTube channels and I would have no problems getting excellent results. When it comes to the dual bay media card slots, Sony get this right. They support both CF Express Type A 
and UHS2 SD card slots, and you can choose which one you want to use. The CF Express Type A cards will allow you to shoot in every mode on the camera, and if you buy V90 SD cards, you can use the majority of them, including 422 10-bit up to 120 frames per second. And if you want to save a few bucks, the V90 cards are far more affordable than the CF Express Type A. They're overpriced. I have no idea why they're so expensive, but it is what it is. If you plan on running this camera in a studio, we get a full-size HDMI port, which is fantastic. No dongles or accessories required. You can just plug it in and you're good to go. We also get the ability to charge the battery internally thanks to a provided power cable. Now, the power cable that we get and little charger isn't USB PD. If you wanna run this camera indefinitely via that USB-C port, then you'll need to make sure you get a nine volt three amp power supply. I'll leave a link in the cards to a video that I produced a while ago explaining how I run these cameras on power. If you want to do some type of live streaming or Skype call with professional video quality, you can simply plug this into a USB port on your computer, select the webcam option, fire up your app, and you'll be in business, and the video quality looks great. To wrap this video up, I want to talk about the FX30 and whether or not you should buy it over the FX3 or any other number of cameras out there on the market. So I hope this is helpful. This just comes from my own user experience. So the FX3 is an absolute powerhouse of a camera, and if you need something with great low light performance, go full frame. It's this big sensor, it's this great low light performance that makes this legendary and I can highly recommend it if you're planning on shooting a short film or doing a lot of low light work. But the reality of it is not everyone will be pushing these sensors to the maximum and this is where the FX30 makes so much more sense. I can never get these caps on when I'm not looking at it. The FX30 makes so much more sense for any content creator over the FX3. The FX3 is overkill, especially if you're just gonna be using it in a studio situation. The benefit of this FX30 is you can get so many fast lenses now from full frame or APS-C and you'll be able to get really great background blur like you see right now. So save your money and get a great lens and you'll have a killer combination. At the end of the day, the Sony FX30 is an absolute powerhouse for any content creator or filmmaker. Just know the IBIS isn't as strong as other brands, but the eye autofocus works a treat and the overall ergonomics and shooting experience is right up there with the best. This is coming from someone who owns the FX3. I would have much preferred to have bought two FX30s over one of these guys right here. Thanks for watching.